Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and this right here is what it looked like for the Opportunity rover to land on Mars. This is basically its perspective simulated by the, um, well actually a video game called Take on Mars, where you're looking at the landing of the actual rover, specifically about 15 years ago. Now, you may have already heard a lot about uh, the rover and how it was officially announced to be dead by NASA, uh, mostly because it's not really sending us any more signals. Um, but I actually wanted to talk about a few things that you may have not known about the rover and really go through some of the kind of best findings and best things that the uh, both Opportunity and Spirit rovers discovered in the last 15 years. So here we go, we're about to land. This is actually um, something that I wanted to show you from the simulation that NASA made as well, because uh, at this point, there was this really interesting technique that NASA developed 15 years ago that was also one of the uh, more trendy videos um, back in when this mission was landed on Mars. Now, this is actually kind of what the landing site looks like from the outside, and the rover is actually right here. But first, before we start, all right, before I tell you more about the rover, let me show you the video that I mentioned. Or more specifically, I'm just going to play the part that I want to mention, um, and you can watch the video uh, by yourself by using the link in the description. So basically, right here, as the um, actual probe approached, NASA decided that they're gonna try a new technique, the so-called bouncy method. And this is actually something that they didn't even think would work, but they wanted to try it anyway. At least many people didn't believe that it's going to work. But it's this, uh, they had these really awesome pillow-like um, structures that would essentially let the rover drop onto the ground and it would bounce around, stop, the pillows would then um, deflate and the rover would be released. So it was a pretty brilliant technique on how to essentially land a rover um, without really using any extraneous fuel or other methods. So that was actually a pretty cool way of landing things on Mars. But obviously this was just the beginning of the adventure for this little rover that I'm now driving around in Take on Mars. Uh, this simulation is actually really realistic to the point where it can be really frustrating because driving this rover on Mars is not easy. And uh, there's actually some missions that you can try to complete as well, including trying to discover certain samples and so on. I'm not going to do this now, uh, mostly because uh, I think I, I've done this in one of the previous videos from months ago. But anyway, so um, the interesting part about this particular rover, and I guess something that most people don't realize is that its actual maximum speed was only about five centimeters or two inches per second. That's super slow, and that's maximum speed. On average, it wasn't even moving that fast. It usually moved at about one inch or two and a half centimeters per second. That, as you can imagine, uh, took a while. It basically meant that even to get to that rock right there, it would take a pretty long time. Now, when it came to actually having time though, it spent 14 um, or actually almost 15 years of its life on Mars. The original mission though, as you've probably heard, was only supposed to take 90 days. So this means it spent about 55 times longer on Mars than it should have. And what most people don't remember is that it actually had a twin, Spirit, that only uh, lasted for about 6 years, but still way, way, way uh, beyond its mission parameters. Both of these missions produced a tremendous amount of images. All of these images were actually posted online, and all, um, I believe, about 324,000 of them, or actually even more than that, are still available there, and you can actually find them. And a lot of them are very, very beautiful. And today, Curiosity um, holds the record for the farthest ever uh, travel by a single robotic entity on another object. So here we, we have the record of 45.16 kilometers, which is just um, above a typical marathon. The second uh, longest was the Lunar Hot uh, 2 back in 1973. This is on the moon though. But anyway, so uh, it's an extremely successful mission, way, way beyond expectations. And obviously all of this was due to absolutely stellar engineering techniques. The amount of thought that went into every detail was spectacular. Now, even though it was a successful mission, um, it wasn't without problems. There were actually quite a lot of problems throughout the years. And one of the biggest problems was actually with its front wheel that uh, was unfortunately acting a little bit weird, that was actually draining too much energy. And for this reason, the rover uh, almost always drove backwards uh, just to save this front wheel from basically being destroyed. 
And um, a few years ago, actually, I believe almost like 14 years ago, the rover got stuck in the sand for about um, six weeks and they couldn't get it out. They thought it was the end of the mission, but ingenuity once again kind of prevailed because what NASA did was they used um, a very similar model of a rover and basically put it in a sandbox and using various techniques they figure out how to take it out of the sand and then used it again in real life on Mars and it worked. It basically saved the rover. Now even though it essentially used the solar panels that I'm deploying right now for energy, it actually did have um, a little bit of radioactive material, specifically radioisotopes, on the inside to uh, provide heat to various instruments. Um, and when I'm saying that it still does, those radioisotopes are still providing heat. So actually, if we switch the view here to the infrared view, which I think is this button right here, there we go. Some of the warmer objects on the inside are actually heated by, uh, well, essentially uh, radiation. But unfortunately, it wasn't the type of the energy that the other rover, uh, Curiosity rover that's still active, uses for creating energy. And for, this was only used for essentially creating heat. The Curiosity rover that you see right here in a slightly different simulation does have an actual nuclear reactor right there that's basically used for both heating up things and also providing energy, which is why it wasn't really affected by the dust storm um, almost at all, compared to the Opportunity rover that unfortunately was basically ended by it. But anyway, so let's go back to Opportunity rover that's right here and talk a little bit more about some of the problems it experienced. Um, it had quite an interesting computer setup on the inside, but it actually started experiencing horrible, horrible amnesia problems, as NASA called it. Basically, its memory started to have a lot of issues and it wouldn't remember the telemetry data. It wouldn't remember where it used to be. So in other words, it's almost like having, I guess, Alzheimer's uh, for a robot. Um, it literally forgot things very, very often and at some point started rebooting its computer quite a lot. And because of this, uh, NASA actually had to completely disable some of its memory modules. And at the end, right before the end of the mission, it was um, only uh, using RAM, random access memory. So unfortunately, a lot of problems could have caused the end of the mission even before the storm hit. Some other major problems involved the fact that uh, it only had a maximum operating tilt, or basically it could maximum go up the uh, inclination of about 30 degrees, but it actually had to go up about 32 degrees at some point. And so NASA was almost certain it's going to just roll over and well, essentially die. It didn't though, it survived. And um, on the other hand, it actually experienced another dust storm event uh, back in 2007. And uh, essentially its um, panels were almost entirely covered by dust once again. But that uh, storm was not as powerful as the one in 2018. And eventually the Martian wind was actually able to clear the panels. And so it survived that storm and was still able to actively produce enough energy. Now, for the most part, uh, when it comes to en energy production, up until the last day, um, it was producing quite a lot of energy, uh, approximately 650 watt hours of energy, which is actually quite a lot. Uh, but on the last day, uh, right before the sort of end of transmission, it was only producing about 20 watt, of, uh, watt hours, which is basically why it suddenly uh, lost any kind of communication and essentially kind of give up. It's very likely that its battery actually gave up um, and because it lost all of the energy, it couldn't really recharge itself anymore. And so that's kind of how its life ended. Now, a few other things that people don't realize this awesome rover had, it had a lot of cameras. As a matter of fact, there was a panoramic camera. There was also another black and white camera. There was lots and lots of cameras. This was literally like a tourist on Mars, just taking snapshots thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of snapshots. That was kind of really it's one of its main missions. But it also had a microscope. As a matter of fact, it had a way to collect samples by using a magnet and also using a kind of a scraping tool um, that was somewhere inside of there. Um, and using those tools, it was actually able to analyze some samples with the built-in microscope that uh, was actually very, very accurate. And uh, all of these um, tools allowed us to discover, well, for one, one of the most famous images 
the image often referred to as the Martian blueberries. Uh, essentially, these are tiny rocks that uh, were most likely produced in a type of acidic groundwater. And these are sort of the signs of water that used to exist on Mars. This was actually one of the major discoveries uh, from the mission because this definitely showed us that Mars had a lot of water. It also discovered a lot of gypsum deposits, which is what you see on the screen. This is a type of a rock that also needs uh, water to be created. Um, and uh, there's quite a lot of other sediments or sedimental rocks that would discover that were telltale signs to this liquid origin of Mars. In other words, uh, these missions told us that Mars used to be a lot more like Earth in the past. And another thing that most people don't know about this rover, actually both the Spirit and the Opportunity, is that they both included parts uh, from the World Trade Center, specifically the remains of the World Trade Center. Um, and uh, these parts were actually used to construct a type of a shielding system for some of the parts, some of the cables specifically, that were um, very, very close to the drilling apparatus. So there's a lot of really cool things about this mission. This mission is absolutely, absolutely mind-blowing. And the fact that this thing here survived for 15 years, but was only designed for like three months operation is actually quite incredible. Now, one of these days, I actually am planning to build my own rover just for fun. I, I've actually been working on several models using Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's actually surprisingly challenging, at least for a single one person. Um, However, it's super fun. I actually recommend you try uh, buying one of the models uh, that you can find online. They're usually relatively cheap um, and they do allow you to create a very simple robotic sort of creation uh, using a microcomputer. But one day, one day, I want to create something similar to this. As a matter of fact, as similar to this as possible with an actual solar panels, with an actual camera on board that can drill into stuff. That would be absolutely epic. One day, but not today. Today, though, I think that's all I wanted to cover about this particular mission. It's a very, very exciting mission, but unfortunately now it's over. But we still have the Curiosity mission that's active. We also have the InSight mission that's currently actually drilling into the Martian surface. And we have uh, Mars 2020 that's going to be joining all of these missions in, well, 2020. Um, there's going to be quite a lot of really exciting missions coming here. And I think Mars has actually technically been trending for the past few weeks. There's been a lot of really cool discoveries. We discovered a really cool crater. And we now have suggestions that maybe just maybe Mars is actually still geologically active because of the liquid water we discovered um, just over a year ago. Now, anyway, a lot of really cool things. Hopefully one day we'll get to actually land here, maybe even walk around. And hopefully Elon Musk actually um, pulls it through and lands his rockets here within the next 10 years. Until then though, I guess we're going to remember this beautiful mission by possibly playing Take on Mars, because I think this is actually the only simulation I currently am aware of that has a, a very, very accurate representation of the Opportunity rover. And I'm making the little donut very similar to the one that was actually made by the rover when it started operating. They were testing its wheels. And as you can see, very, very cool, very beautiful. Anyway, on that note, um, well, let me know if I forgot something important, but I think I covered some of the more important parts, except for maybe this one. This was actually the 5,000th sunrise on the surface of Mars as filmed by the Opportunity rover. It's, it's pretty epic when you think about it. This is actually what the sun, or specifically sunrise, looks like from Mars. And uh, this is, was the a video provided by NASA, I think from maybe a few years ago. And then we also, of course, have the entire path that was covered by the mission, starting from 2004, right there, near Eagle Crater, down to Victoria Crater, all over the place here, and finally ending near the uh, Marathon Valley, right by the Endeavour Crater. Now, this is Washington, D.C. for comparison. This right here is about 45 kilometers. And so there you have it. That's the Opportunity Mission, and the end of the mission, and the end of the era, I guess but a beginning of a completely new era of exploration and hopefully human missions as well. On that note, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you still haven't. Come back tomorrow to learn something else and maybe even share this video with someone who you think might want to learn through simulations, video games, and all kinds of cool resources that I find to teach about space sciences. Also, maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon because, you know, it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.